Hi everyone, this is Matt with the National Association of EMS Educators. Uh, before we begin today's webinar, I just want to thank everyone for joining us. I'm sorry we started a little bit late here. Um, if you guys have any questions throughout the webinar, there's a little question box on the right hand. Don't be afraid to use it. There's also a chat box. Um, at the end of the webinar, we will be issuing credits. Um, we'll be issuing one credit for this webinar if you are a NEMSI member. If you're not and you'd like to sign up to be a member, it's $90 a month, and you can email me at matt at nemzi.org. All right, with that being said, we have a great webinar today presented by Loger Barnes. It's Ethical Leadership leadership in EMS, a Roadmap to Enhancing Ethical Behavior. Loger? All right, good morning. Uh, my name is Loger Barnes. Uh, I guess I should say good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you're sitting this, uh, this morning. For me, it's 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, for you, it may be a little later. I'm happy that you have joined us today, and I wanted to open up a dialogue on ethical leadership. Um, <clears throat> although we're going to discuss several uh, ethical decision-making strategies and how it affects EMS across the nation, I also want participants uh, such as you to discuss this and what your thinking is so we can open up that dialogue in EMS, because I, I think this is something that we have not really addressed in EMS. So please, if you have questions, um, put a little question in your text box and let's have a dialogue about this uh, so I can facilitate this conversation rather than just talking at you. So Matt, do you wanna click? All right. Next slide. Okay, so the first question we have is, do we have a problem in EMS? And go ahead, next slide. And if you'll see the next several slides, um, these are things that have been in the news recently. So EMT pleads guilty to stealing pain meds from a patient. Um, next slide, uh, cheating suspected on Cleveland paramedic exam. And I'm sure we've all heard of other uh, incidents of cheating on even on the National Registry and other exams that we have. <clears throat> next slide. Um, some of you may be familiar with this one. Florida paramedics charged in selfie war with patient photos. So they took uh, pictures of themselves with their unconscious patients um, and were having a war to see who could get the most um, interesting photos, I guess. So again, next slide, paramedic charged with sexual battery after alleged inappropriate behavior with patients. So we are alone in the back end of the truck oftentimes, so that opens us to accusations as well as gives us the ability to potentially do things that are not appropriate. Uh, next one, uh, Detroit EMT refuses to respond to infant and cardiac arrest. Uh, another one that has happened in the last couple of years and this is not the only one that we've experienced. Next slide. Uh, it even goes up the chain. So here we're talking about the medical director resigning after she calls the department toxic in Washington, D.C. Fire Department. So it's not just the individual uh, provider that we're talking about. We're also talking about the organizational ethical climate. Um, and the next slide, this is more recent in the news, um, EMSA in Tulsa, Steve Williamson amid a kickback lawsuit. So we're talking about from the very top CEO all the way down to um, your line medic provider. So if we look at the next slide, are there potential consequences? So whenever we're talking about making an ethical decision, there are potential consequences. So if we go to the next slide, um, whistleblowers, EMT hearing unfair. So there's the potential that somebody could get fired. Um, so when we think about why people do not um, voice their concerns when an incident occurs that we all think, oh, how did that happen? How did those um, paramedics send selfies back and forth? And there were several people that knew about it, yet it took quite a while before it became uh, well known. Um, people cheating, you know, sometimes there's a whole culture of unethical behaviors that um, people don't want to talk about. And here's the case, you know, we may lose our jobs. Um, it may destroy someone's career. 
So next slide, Matt. Um, so it could make um, people who are higher up in the organization have the ability to put pressure on those down below them. Um, the next slide, if you look, um, this firefighter uh, actually committed suicide. Um, so it can go anywhere from the pressure being so great <clears throat> that you that somebody were to commit suicide. So those are pretty big potential consequences for people. So if we can create a climate of ethical decision making within an organization, then we are supporting people who are trying to do the right thing. So that is the reason that we go ahead and click Matt. Uh, decided to do a webinar on ethics in EMS and in EMS leadership. So some of the things we're going to talk about today is the difference between ethics and morals. And I know we have a little bitty chapter in our textbook that talks about ethics and morals. So whether that's, you know, initial education or whether that's leadership education, we, we spend a couple of minutes on that. Um, we're going to talk about a few examples of ethical philosophies because if we understand the philosophies, and again, the next um, objective is discussing different ethical lenses that people use to make decisions. You know, that helps us understand how somebody else made a decision they made that we don't necessarily dis dis agree with. Um, that being said, both decisions may be ethical, um, but we're coming at them from different perspectives. So I think if we understand that, understanding that really helped me when I was thinking, well, how could this person in this meeting I'm at possibly have that um, opinion? You know, and so we tend to get a little judgmental about that because we're sure that we have the correct answer. But when you understand that there are different lenses that people make decisions based on, based on their values, based on their experiences, then we can start understanding their viewpoints. And I think that's where we start being able to get some consensus. Um, and then last thing we're gonna talk about is developing, developing some strategies to enhance ethical behavior and dis, uh, decision making within your department. Uh, that could be a college, that could be an EMS agency, um, wherever you're working, a college. So we want to enhance those behaviors. And at the very end, I also give some um, examples of a worksheet that I give to students, and they are real uh, dilemmas that I've either experienced or been involved in or been asked about, and we have the students work through some of that. So we'll talk about that, and I also have a, a handout that I can provide to you if you want to kind of work, um, include that into your curriculum. So. Uh, go on, on to the next slide, Matt. So talking about ethics versus morals. So oftentimes people use these interchangeably. They're not really interchangeable. If we're talking about morals, we're talking about an individual. So that is something you internalize individually. So it's what we inherently believe in. It gets based on our values and our culture. It's basically our compass of what is right, what is wrong. Should I do that or should I not do that? So it's considered very subjective. When we discuss ethics, we're talking about rules of conduct that are recognized for a group such as EMS. So that's our profession. Um, it's a social system and it's considered more objective rather than subjective. So it's our professional guidelines that we all follow. So moving on to the next um, slide, teleology and deontology. So I know those are a bit of tongue twisters, um, but it's basically the two principles that guide ethics. So there's consequentialist and it's Kind of easy to remember if you think about consequences. So teleology focuses on what are the outcomes. Basically, the ends justify the means. Um, so it doesn't really matter how you got to that point, just that you got to that point. It was positive for the greater majority of people. Deontology, on the other hand, is non-consequential, which states that it's the intention behind the action. So the outcome really doesn't matter. 
as long as you had good intentions. So we've all heard the road to hell was paved with good intentions. So there are positives and negatives to both of those. But um, moving on to the next slide, here are the decision-making lines. These, there are more, sometimes there's more, sometimes there's less, but these are the basic ones, and these are what guides our decisions. So the frameworks that people use um, to evaluate and justify their decisions <clears throat> are based on their decision-making lens. So this, is, this explains what I talked about earlier. Um, how can we come up with different responses? And for the most part, I think, you know, you believe the people that you work with are ethical people and are trying to make the right decision, but yet they still might come up with a different answer than you do at the end of the day. So utilitarianism um, talks about the greatest good for the majority of people. Deontology, as we talked about, they follow rules. It's about duty and following the rules. Justice talks about fairness. Is it fair to everybody? Virtue, virtuous quality. So um, you're focusing more on integrity. It's more internal and individualistic than the other ones are. Uh, rights refer to human dignity. So you could find yourself on various scales of this. This is a continuum and not necessarily a black and white. Next slide. Um, so when we talk about utilitarianism, it means you should always make the decision that benefits the most people for the greatest good. The ends justify the means. So you out there in um, webinar land, do you agree with that statement? Um, it seems pretty, um, oh yeah, sure I do. Um, why would anybody not believe in that, right? If you go to the next slide, this is an extreme situation of utilitarianism that you see in ethics philosophy sometimes. So, for example, a train is coming, it's going to strike and kill five people, including a child. You're standing there, you're watching this, you're seeing it about to happen. As a utilitarian uh, person, um, the people on the tracks are too far away to hear. If you pull a lever, the train will travel down a different track where there's only one person standing. So if you divert the train, you only kill one versus killing five people that are standing on the other side of the train or the other side of the track. So how many people are willing to pull the lever to save five people, which means basically that you had a decision in killing the other person. So you're making a conscious decision to, you know, change um, the path of that train. Whereas if you just let it go, you can kind of say, oh, well, I had nothing to do with it, right? So oftentimes we see people standing by and saying, well, I had nothing to do with that. You know, yes, I saw it happening. I knew it was going to happen, but I didn't participate. So things are not always as black and white as we would like them to be. Um, next slide. So deontology, it says when we're following the rules and the procedures, which again, you know, it sounds perfectly uh, legitimate. Um, lying is inherently wrong, therefore one should never lie, right? So that is the process, the intent is ethical. Uh, lying is bad. So do you agree with, with that? philosophy. And if we go to the next slide, deontology, um, again, another extreme example, but it kind of helps frame these different philosophies. You and your sibling are at home. Someone comes to the door carrying an ax. They're mad at your sibling and tell you that they're going to kill your sibling uh, and ask if they're in the house. So do you lie to them? If we're thinking about pure deontology, if I truly believe that lying is wrong under all circumstances, then I go ahead and say, um, yes, my sibling's in the house, knowing that they're probably about to get axed, right? So in this situation, the process and the intent of the decision is more important than the actual outcome. So moving on to justice and fairness, everyone should be treated the same. For example, everyone doing the same job should receive the same wage. Do you agree with justice and fairness? And again, on its surface, it seems like what could possibly go wrong? But if we click to the next slide, um, it, it, you know, this is common in, where unions exist. You know, somebody 
everybody's getting the same wage, even though we know that everybody is not performing at the same level. Y'all, you're all paramedics, you're all firefighters, you're all doing the same job, you get the same raises at the end of every year. Um, so we see issues with that as well. Moving on to the next slide. Here's virtue, which can be a little bit confusing. These are your personal values. What do you value as an individual? So some of the virtues that we talk about is honesty, kindness, patience, civility, compassion, diligence, self-reliance, loyalty, fairness, courage, tolerance, conscientiousness, generosity, temperance, self-control, prudence, humility. So those are some of the big ones. And the reason I read those <laughs> off the slide and you're thinking, what is she doing? Because I really want you to think about those are virtues that hopefully we want to encourage in all of our employees, uh, our leaders, our managers. So I think thinking about the virtue lens is important. So consistently choose to do the good, th good act deliberately only for the virtue of doing the right thing. So if you agree with this, let me go on to the next slide. Again, we are only doing this from a personal, uh, internal motivation to do the right thing consistently. And what this um, philosophy says is that as you do these things, you practice them consistently, you become more virtuous and you are more likely to make the virtuous decision um, as time goes on. Rights, again, respect for human dignity. People have a right to live the way they want to as long as they're not hurting others. Um, and everyone deserves basic human rights. So if you agree with this lens, then you're looking at, next slide, are you willing to provide people with basic human necessities, such as education, healthcare, food, shelter, both based solely on the fact that they are human beings? So, um, next slide ethical lenses and core values. As you can see, while we have numerous lenses, um, most people are not to the extreme. So there are different continuums along this uh, when we're talking about philosophies and how you pr approach decision making. And there's actually a website where you can go on and you can take a quiz. It does cost a little bit of money. I can't remember exactly how much, but it will tell you exactly where you fit on the continuum between rationality and sensibility and autonomy versus equality, which encompass all of the philosophies we were just talking about. It kind of gives you, oh, you're more likely to follow rules. You're more likely to think about fairness and justice and those types of things. So next slide. So again, as we talked about um, earlier, most of us make decisions based on a mixture of ethical philosophies and it depends on our values, our personal values, and they may or may not reflect that of the organization. And here's really, um, I think, what is salient to us, what's important to us. Um, oftentimes, organizational values and individual values do not really align well. So you have some incongruency there. So the goal is to try to make individual and organizational values um, match up as consistently as possible because when we have that inconsistency, it is stressful for employees. Um, so that's what the research shows, that this stress causes um, worse behaviors, burnout, those kinds of things that we don't want to see. So we can move on to the, less, the next slide. Why do we care? And that's what we just talked about. What we have seen in the research is if we enhance ethics, if we help people to understand what is an ethical dilemma and how should they manage it, then we increase organizational citizen, citizenship behaviors. So, um, organizational citizenship behaviors are things that we want to see in our organizations. We want people to help each other. We want them to um, talk to other employees and say, hey, here, let me help you do that. We don't want to see what we call um, workplace deviant behaviors, which is uh, across from organizational behaviors because those are negative. So people are not treating each other well, they're creating hostility. I mean, I've seen that in multiple EMS agencies and colleges, 
where we're just not getting along well. Uh, we're not nice to each other. So that's what we're trying to improve upon. So the other thing that will happen is people will be more satisfied with their jobs. Turnover will decrease. That's huge in EMS. Uh, our turnover is very high. People get very frustrated. They get burned out. And all of this is going to lead at the end of the day to an increase in organizational performance. And again, um, if employees are happier, they're going to perform better, they're going to want to do things above what their baseline role is, what they're required to do. We've all heard the person say, oh, that's not in my job description, right? But we still might want them to go ahead and take care of the issue and not just ignore it because it's, quote, not in their job description. So next slide. Now what? Um, if you look at the research, fortunately, um, we can improve people's ability to make ethical choices. And the first thing that we need to do is provide some training and education. The number one problem that often exists is that people do not recognize the issue at the time to be an ethical dilemma. So on first uh, blush, it does not appear to be an ethical problem, but when you go back and you think about it, it's like, oh yeah, I could see there were some ethical components to that. Things aren't necessarily as black and white as what we saw in our examples early on um, when we talked about uh, the EMT stealing meds or we talked about somebody potentially taking kickbacks and things like that. Typically, those ethical behaviors don't start out huge like that. They start out small and they grow from there. So if we can recognize those small dilemmas, we are more prepared to respond to the bigger dilemmas. Um, the next thing is to develop an ethical organizational culture. So how do we do that? So we're going to talk about some strategies to do all of those things. And one thing to, in order to develop an ethical culture, you have to assess your culture. So I don't know how many on there actually assess the ethical culture. I know in education it's becoming a little bit more common. Um, that we get a little survey that kind of says, you know, how do you feel about this? How do you feel about that? Uh, how do you get along with your boss? How do you think about your supervisor? How do you think about the CEO, et cetera, et cetera? So that's an attempt to kind of gauge the climate of the organization. So I actually, for one of my doctorate classes, did an ethical climate uh, assessment of an organization. And what was really interesting to me is I think we all claim that we want to be ethical. Nobody says, oh, I don't want to be ethical, or I don't want to know if we have a climate within our organization that's um, ethical or not ethical. But when it comes down to actually finding out, people are very hesitant. Um, I'm a person who believes strongly that we can't wash the dirty laundry if we don't pull the dirty laundry out. Uh, not everybody believes that. Some people are very hesitant to pull the dirty laundry out because then everybody knows, hey, we've got a problem. But what organization doesn't? So when I started trying to do my ethical climate assessment, um, what I found is people would tell me, oh, absolutely, you can do it here. And then I hit a lot of resistance and a lot of challenges. So they would kind of frame the challenges. You know, I asked a um, major EMS organization if I could do it there. Oh, absolutely, we do this all the time. Not a problem. It was all anonymous, so there was, um, you know, no way for people to know um, what was said by whom um and yet the organization started not returning my phone calls and like oh well i've got to take this to the board or i got to take this to my advisory committee or whatever um eventually it became clear they weren't interested i think they were interested but they really were a little bit afraid to know so next i go to another organization that i have had dealings with asked about it, I'm getting a little desperate now, and they're like, oh, yes, of course, we do this all the time. Well, the next thing you know, I'm talking about, oh, well, you have to get an IR, IRB. So if, if you guys are aware, you know, if you want to do research, then you have to get an IRB. But this was really just a survey. 
Um, and I said, well, that's going to take six to eight weeks. And they said, oh, yes, you know. And so there was no way for me to do that in, in a short semester. So finally, I'm desperately sitting in my office thinking, I'm about to fail this program. You know, what am I going to do? And I had, uh, I had a partnership with a local police department where we trained their officers to be EMTs. And my lead paramedic SOT guy said, well, you can do it at the police department. Well, think back about a year or two um, and think about, you know, what the feelings were about law enforcement. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. There is no way you guys are going to let me do this. And he goes, oh, yeah, absolutely. We don't have a problem with it. And I'm thinking, you guys are accused of being the most unethical people in the world. Um, so he kind of laughed. I said, well, get call your supervisor, you know, call somebody in charge and see if they will actually let us do this. So he called the major and the major said, absolutely. So we sent out surveys across, um, you know, electronically, hand copied, everything was anonymous. And honestly, they had a tremendous, tremendous ethical culture and they weren't afraid to assess it, find out where they were, and then respond to that and I think that's what I would challenge everybody to do um, you have to be open to being honest sorry about the birds in the background again I'm in Hawaii and there's like chickens out there too and you have to be willing to be honest and open with yourselves and be willing to face um, that it may not be where you want it to be right now so be courageous next slide so ethical dilemmas, what we just talked about is people often don't recognize the dilemma at the time that it happens. Uh, looking back, they might say, oh, you know, that was a problem. Um, so the conflict could potentially have a negative outcome. Right and wrong is the easiest, right? Things are clearly right, things are clearly wrong. Sometimes things are right, right, and we have to decide what is the better right, or some things are wrong, wrong, which are considered the most difficult. Both responses are not the best, but we have to make that decision. So, next slide. So, for example, is child labor unethical? Again, another extreme um, example, so it kind of anchors it for us. Your manager at a U.S. company who outsources overseas, the company always uses child labor, which is customary in the foreign country where poverty is pervasive. You as a manager, do you continue this practice? So think about it. If you feel like answering, answer that. Um, and what would you do, you know, if you had the power to stop this? So in the United States, of course, we are not big fans of child labor. So most of us would say, yes, child labor is very unethical and we are not going to support that. So if we have the ability as a manager, we're going to say, no, we're not going to do that. So if we move on to the next slide, it may not be as easy as it looks. So you attempt to curtail the practice, and the kids come to you and they're desperate. They're begging you to keep their jobs. They tell you this is the income that provides the food and shelter for the entire family. Without this job, the family will be homeless. So again, that is what we would consider a pretty easy right wrong. And at the end of the day, it may not be as right and wrong as we thought about it, you know, knowing that, hey, if we fire all these kids and try to hire other people, these families are going to end up homeless and without any food to feed the other kids. So next slide. So ethical erosion. So when we talk about being ethical, most of us start out being ethical, right? Um, everybody wants to do the right thing, and often it occurs without awareness. So what the research shows is it's very insidious. Um, it starts out with small things, um, and of course we all know the person that is not ethical to begin with, but I think most of us try to be ethical. So you face a dilemma in which you make an unethical decision that's somewhat minor. And so what we find is once you make one small unethical um, decision, it becomes easier to make bigger unethical decisions. And you see that if you look at some of the ethical dilemmas that have happened across the country, some of the big ones. You know, things start out very small and they just seem to just blow out of proportion. You know, have you ever taken a pen from work? I mean, how many people would consider that unethical? But again, 
the pen belongs to your employer, you know, and so the next day, you know, you're taking something more and more until you're walking home with the uh, laptop or actually um, had uh, people who have sold their um, tablet that was provided by the organization because it's just this small incremental thing. And they're like, oh, they had no, absolutely no idea when confronted that that was unethical and they should not have done that. So we all have a different baseline of where we come from, what's ethical, what's appropriate, and what isn't. So if you go to the next slide, what we have is the potential. Once ethical erosion starts, we have ethical drift, a slippery slope, and the snowball effect. So those are all things that, you know, make decisions more unethical and more consistently un unethical as unethical decisions go unchallenged. So if we don't address this within our organizations, um, again, whether that's an EMS agency, whether that's a college, whether that's um, whatever it is, we are just going to continue to promote this without even knowing that we're promoting unethical behaviors if we don't address it. Next slide. So ethical fatigue occurs towards the end of the baseline. So typically we have things like uh, HR who are supposed to look out for this for us. Um, if you are in a particularly uh, an ethical environment, then it becomes a matter of choosing your battle. Battle. So once people are saying, "Hey, I'm just choosing my battle," so you have an issue, you go to the right people that you're supposed to go to, and they're like, "Hey, that is not a big enough deal. I'm just choosing my battles." You should recognize that now they're in the ethical fatigue phase, um, and they're just trying to pick the most egregious. So that's not necessarily a good place where we want to be. So um, next slide. If we think about psychological and emotional incongruency, we talked about this earlier, and I know there's a lot of words on this slide, so you can kind of peruse them as, we're, as I'm talking about it. But we talked earlier about do we have congruency or consistency between the organization's values and our individual values? And of course, most people would say, well, of course we do. We don't want people lying, cheating, stealing. Um, but we have little things that we do. So here are some things that I've seen in EMS. So we have unofficial expectations that conflict with our published policies and procedures. And if we have those going on, you know, it's very frustrating for the provider. I've had providers call me and say, hey, you know, my policy says this, but I'm being pushed to do this. I don't know what to do. And I'm like, well, if you are calling me asking me, you already know what the right thing to do is, but you're stressed, you know, because they're concerned about losing their jobs or being treated, you know, being subject to hostile environments. So, for example, we publish, oh, 10 miles over the speed limit is the fastest you can go. And yet we push crews to get there as fast as possible so we can turn that unit back around. Um, so, actually, was somewhat involved, knew the people involved on Christmas Day a few years back. Um, and Amos was in a residential area speeding. They ended up T-boning a car, which killed the driver on Christmas Day. Never a good outcome anyway, even worse, made even worse by this season. Um, I knew this person, good person, had no intentions to do any harm. Ultimately, when it was supposed to go to court, they're saying, well, we publish only, you know, you can't go 10 miles over the speed limit. This guy was going significantly faster than that. He, his answer was, well, this is what you push us to do, get there faster, get there faster. And this was a common thing that happened out in the field. People consistently went well over 10 miles over the speed limit to try to meet the time demands. Um, this time there happened to be a bad outcome and the company said, hey, we published 10 miles over the speed limit. However, what is your, uno is your unofficial expectation different than what you published? Then you need to sit down, have some conversations and decide what the answer should be so that you can be more consistent. Because again, this incongruency causes a lot of stress to your providers. It increases the effect of burnout and high turnover, which is huge in EMS. We talk about EMS and HEMS. We say we're committed to safety of, and this is not just air crews, so I don't want to pick on them, um, 
but it's also ground crews. We have huge shifts anywhere from 24 to 96 hours. I used to work 96 hours straight. Um, and we don't have any mechanism in place. I know, and I'm sure most of you can raise your hands and say, oh yeah, I've done that as well, working over 36 hours without ever coming back to the station because you're just getting back-to-back -back calls, long distance transfers to other states. I was in three states in the span of 26 hours. Um, so if we're doing that to our crews, are we really saying we are committed to their safety? And again, we see in the news over and over, um, ambulance crashes, fatalities, uh, and the EMT not too long ago um, charged with murder. So we need to start taking some responsibility, not blaming the crew who, of course, they say, well, I need the money, so I have to work. But if we're in leadership, we need to use our positions in a positive manner to improve things. What could we do? There's many models out there um, to affect that. And again, what does our mission or value statement say? Do we say that our entire goal is to provide excellent, compassionate care? And then we're constantly harassing our crews like you've been at the on scene too long, you've been there 10 minutes, when we know the vast majority of our calls, less than 10% are life threats, right? So are we really consistent with what we're saying and what we're doing? Uh, next slide. So incongruence, this is what results when we have a disconnect between organization and the individual. It, it increases fatigue. It decreases our commitment to the organization we're working for. It increases incivility. So how much uncivil behavior do we have between crews, between patient care providers and patients? You know, I've had people, agencies call me and say, I don't care if you teach them to be good paramedics, just teach them how to treat people with respect. So that's huge. It increases stress, turnover, decreases engagement and decreases the behaviors that we are seeking to enhance. Next slide. So five disciplines of an ethical culture. Mindfulness. We have to be self-aware. We have to be willing to pull out the dirty laundry, look at it, look for subtle clues, voice. So that talks about encouraging people to speak up honestly, have integrity, challenge any practices that we think are not ethical or not right, and have an open, honest dialogue without fear of retribution. Respect, we have to value each other's diversity and collaborate on things. Tenacity, stay committed to finding resolutions that are best for our patients, best for our providers, and best for our agency. And then create a positive legacy. Next slide. So education and training, we talked about that earlier. Um, provide case studies. So I've given you a few here and I can send you my whole, I have about 12 written out. Um, provide case studies of varying levels, integrate, integrate ethical dilemmas into scenarios. I know a lot of people are doing that, you know, whether it's just having real cash on a patient in a scenario. Uh, open for discussion, talk about it. How do people respond differently? and Why do they respond differently? Um, is there more than one correct response? Provide a safe environment for all of this to happen. And what you're going to see is an increase in ethical behaviors. So review your mission statement, your organizational values regularly. Sit down with your line people, whether that's a medic, whether that's faculty, and see if they feel that they're congruent with what you're asking them to do. One of the things you might consider, one of the studies showed that if people reviewed the Ten Commandments before they were given ethical dilemmas, they tended to respond more ethically. So maybe we could consider reviewing the EMT oath in class before we had people um, making those decisions or before they went out on the road or something like that. What is your um, ethical oath or values within your agency? So keep reminding people of those. Next slide. So leadership, leadership, you have to be a role, role model for ethical behaviors. If you are not, you know, walking the talk, people are not going to um, believe you, right? Assess your culture, um, identify baselines so that you can improve from there. Nobody's perfect, so that's all we can do. We're always a work in prog progress. Practice ethical clarity and plan change. So when we're going to change, 
make sure that we are moving in an ethical direction and explain that to people. Uh, participative change, let people be participate in decisions. Um, it's more damaging to express ethical values and act inconsistently than to just say, hey, this is our goal. And there are ways to frame those that are positive without you know, saying that we're being unethical or negative. So just think about at the end of the day what your organization stands for. Transparency, be transparent. People so often hide what they're trying to do because they don't want a kickback, but I think we get a better response when we're transparent. So next benefits, next slide, um, and all of the things we talked about before, you're gonna see things improve within your organization. Um, Next slide. So some of the strategies, mediating principle of isolation, teaching, and bystanding. So basically, what's a person like me to do in a situation like this? Next slide. So mediating, this comes back to the deontological and utilitarianism, the most common approach uh, that people use when they lack clear rules or they don't feel like they're gonna be supported by their administration. So advantages are we are balancing viewpoints, but we may we may not actually resolve the issue because we keep going back and forth. And at some point, we need a resolution. Next slide. Principles seem to be um, the best um, model to follow for the most part. So managers show self-reliance and autonomy, and so they actually enhance participation. They open communication lines. They're transparent. It may initially cause some tension or stress, but ultimately these typically end up working out the best. Next is isolation and bystanding. That never works well. Um, managers distance themselves. They avoid and conceal issues. We've all dealt with managers like that. Um, the layers affair or management by exception when we're just waiting for something bad to happen before we slap somebody on the nose with the newspaper, right? So typically this just increases problems, deteriorates uh, collegiality and relationships within the organization. So teaching, um, here the people are role models of ethical behavior, which we want, but again, we have to get to a resolution. If we don't get to a res resolution, then people will get frustrated. So while we are trying to teach and have these discussions, sometimes it's better to utilize um, the principle of approach where we get to a resolution and then look back and then do the teaching. Next slide. We started a little late, so I've kind of been blowing through a little more quickly. Uh, final thoughts. So reflect on past situations. Sit down and talk about these. Uh, talk about them with your line people, with your management. Be systematic and consistent. Provide examples of appropriate responses and reward ethical behaviors. You know, um, don't ignore sanctioned unethical behaviors. I see a lot of people ignoring unethical behaviors because they don't want to deal with it. Those are usually your problem employees. And rather than, you know, kind of have that uncomfortable discussion with them, we just kind of ignore it and say, oh, well, everybody else will pick up the slack, which leads to, you know, problems within the organization. There's a couple slides next with uh, references. And if you click on past those two slides, there are some, so this is the top part of the discussion sheet I use with students. Um, I have them choose five scenarios plus um, number 12 to respond to, write your responses on a separate piece of paper, be prepared to lead a discussion on one, and add to the discussion of others. So you would think things would not really progress well, but they actually progress very well. Um, so it usually takes a, a bigger amount of time than you plan on. And again, let them know, are there potential consequences to your actions? Because people always perform better if we think about how am I gonna respond if I see this situation? And again, we all know that just because you're right doesn't mean things don't, that things end up well for you. So people need to be, to understand that in advance. So if you click to the next one, um, just to review a couple, there's several slides in there um, that uh, talk about just situation. So this was a, a true situation uh, one of my students came to me with. 
Uh, he tested the registry. He went in, the evaluator talked to him for a while, asked him if he was employed, where he went to school, which we all know is a no-no. He was friendly. At the, he asked him if he ran, um, had ever run a code. This was the AED station for AE&T. And he said yes. And at the end of that, the evaluator said, well, I think you have the requisite knowledge and, knowledge and passed him. So does an ethical, and what really brought this home to me was the student came to me two weeks later. I ended up calling the National Registry and dealing with it that way. I said, you know, I have to call the registry. He said, yes, ma'am, thank you for doing something. Because apparently he reported it to the rep he said, are you willing to write out a report on the incident? And he said, no. Um, I don't, you know, this guy is an evaluator. He's above me. No, I don't want my name on that piece of paper. And so the rep said, well, I got a piece of paper here that says you passed. And so if you're not willing to write it down, which does become a problem for us. But after a couple of weeks, he came to me and decided he couldn't live with it. So when we talked to the whole class, um, and not as like through this, um, everybody said they would not have, they would not have reported it so, because they passed and they felt like they were all competent. So why rock the boat, you know? But then when we talk about, well, you know, how many people over the years has this guy evaluated and what is the outcome and things like that, um, what their responsibility is, everybody started thinking, oh, well, maybe this is a bigger situation than I thought about, and maybe I didn't handle it correctly. So this just opens up that conversation. Um, there's a couple more slides, um, and I know we don't really have time, and I want to um, open it up to anyone that has any comments or questions, or anybody, if you want the entire worksheet, I'm happy to, um, provide that to people, and um, again, these are just situations that I've kind of run across, so you can make up your own. Um, Matt, do you have anything on your end? I do not. Thank you very much, Lerge. I thought it was a really great webinar, and thank you everyone to, who attended. Um, if you are looking to reference this anytime in the future, we will post this to the NEMSI website under the member benefits section. Um, our next web webinar will be Wednesday, January 10th, 2018 at 12 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, once again, thank you to everyone who attended and we hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Matt.